Welcome to another edition of Dentalpreneur Secrets. And wow, am I excited for you today. By the time we finish our conversation, you are going to know how the R&D tax credit applies to you and a dentist and really how that R&D credit can help you add cash flow to your practice. You're going to have a new way about thinking about your practice. You're going to approach it from a research and design perspective, but more importantly, you're going to feel excited about finding some new money in your practice for things you're already doing. And we have some great guests today. We've got Dr. Tax Credit. We've got uh, Scott and Ben, and they're going to be sharing with you some ways that you can find money that's already in your practice, and they're going to give you that new way of thinking. Ben, Scott, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you having us on. So why don't you give me a little bit of background and give our listeners just a little bit of background of, of who you are and how you got started doing this. Go right ahead, Ben. Sure. Uh, thanks, guys. So my name is Ben Dykes. I am a dentist. So I, I practiced dentistry for oh, about a decade and had a, a number of practices myself before I decided to go to law school. Um, so I went to law school to study healthcare law. There were a number of things that I, I discovered and, uh, and um, got to experience as a healthcare provider myself that made me really identify the importance of having someone who speaks both the languages of healthcare and the law. So that's my background. I, I'm a, a dentist, still uh, practice occasionally, but most of my time is spent in healthcare law. Um, as, as a healthcare attorney, I worked with a lot of businesses. A lot of doctors represented a lot of doctors in, in state board issues and peer review, but also a lot of businesses and really got into the, uh, the beauty of, of healthcare business. In that process, discovered quite a bit of uh, knowledge I wish I had had when I had my own practices. Among those was the, the R&D tax credit. And that's where we got started with, with this process. Excellent. You know, you know, Tim, Ben's being modest. You're, you're talking about a really rare breed of a person who literally is a, ten, a dentist who owned his own practices, goes back, gets a law degree, and then mixes those two together and creates this synergy that, that, that is what our uh, doctor tax credit is really developed from, which, it, which is pretty amazing when you think about those two diverse backgrounds coming together and then that kind of a knowledge base getting out to the dental world and saying, hey, listen, not only do I know you, I've been in your shoes, and let me show you how to use what I know to, to better your life and your practice. So he's modest, but there, there's a lot more to it than he's not saying. Well, I will tell you one thing. When I, when I came out of uh, law school, my kids were teenagers and that's enough to keep you modest, but I have a daughter and, and she gave me a, a card that said, congratulations. Uh, congratulations, dad. We're proud of you. You're now the two things most people hate all wrapped up into one. Huh. So it's the quality of uh, being a dentist and an attorney all together. Oh, that's a funny one. And, and, and Scott, what's your background? So I, my background is financial planning and I started I was taught by a CPA back in the late 90s, and for the last 20 years, most of our practice has been centered around working with tax professionals um, and designing people's practices or small businesses around tax planning first, and then second, um, all the other things that you're investing in. Um, there's a lot of guys that can invest for you out there in mutual funds, ETF stocks, and all that in a variety of different wonderful ways. But we found that the number one bill you have year over year is, is Uncle Sam. And if you can address that first and do it well, everything else just kind of falls into place. And that, that's kind of our background. And just, just in full disclosure, so I'm a registered investment advisory representative with Acquire Consult. Um, I'm registered in the state of Utah. We're registered in a number of other states. Um, we're an independent uh, company. Um, and this podcast is a marketing communication and the information we're about to talk about doesn't constitute any investment or tax advice or recommendation to buy, sell, buy, sell, or hold any security. And that's just our little disclaimer that this is really about Dr. Tax Credit and what we're talking about today. Yeah, absolutely. So now, you know, you may be listening to this and thinking, I'm a dentist. I, 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 I you know, do fillings and cleanings and crowns and bridges. What does research and develop, 
do with anything. And so could you give us a little background on this credit and, and why it is so important for dentists to pay attention to this? And Ben, I sure think this is really your area of expertise. Why don't you take some time and really lay the groundwork for us? Yeah. So a little history on this uh, tax credit itself. It came about in 1981. Uh, it was initially created to really keep uh, research and development, to really keep some innovation in the United States. And that's what it rewards. It rewards innovation that happens in the U.S. Now, between 1981 and, and 2015, there really wasn't a lot of application for dentists. And that's why most haven't heard of this. Most healthcare professionals didn't really find a lot of benefit to the R&D tax credit. That all changed in 2015. There was a, a, a tax act passed called the PAP Act. It's uh, protecting Americans from tax hikes. So they've all got to have an acronym there. But this PATH Act really redefined and broadened what the R&D tax credit could do and who it could benefit. So it went from being just manufacturers and pharmaceutical companies to really applications in all kinds of business so long as they were based in hard sciences. And that's why today we, we do call it the research and development tax credit, but just as often we call it the um, you know, business improvement tax credit. For us, everything we do in healthcare is based in the hard sciences. And these hard sciences are biological sciences, computer engineering, um, physical sciences, things like that. So we do everything we do. How we treat patients is all biological sciences. We see a lot of benefit. We see a lot of opportunity to use this in healthcare. So that's the, the background of it. The other nice thing about the 2015 change to this is it not only broadened how it can apply, but it really added a couple additional categories. Um, it, it allowed us to apply it not only to immediate years or one or two years in the past, but to go back three years. And that's really even changed this year with the CARES Act. We can now go back and, and gain some of these tax credits for up to five years retroactively. So huge benefit there. We're going to talk a little bit later about how we calculate it, but that's the foundation of, of where it came from um, and why this law exists. But how does it apply to dentistry? was kind of your next question, Tim. Yeah, and, exactly. Yeah. How does it apply to, to the, the dentist who's in their practice every day? Yeah, there's a four-part test that you've got to satisfy to really prove that you are doing research and development. Now, one of those parts we already talked about, it's got to be based in hard science. Another part says that it's got to be a, an approved business component, which really means you're trying to do something to improve the predictability or the profitability or the outcome of some process you already do. A third component um, says that there has to be a process of experimentation. A fourth component says that there has to be some uncertainty. That you can't just know the answer. There can't be enough documentation that you know what you're getting into from the beginning. So when we look at this and we say, okay, what are our procedures? What is the equivalent of manufacturing or of creating a software program for, for dentists. It really is the procedure that we develop and we deliver to our patients. All day long, what we're doing is we are experimenting. We have dental practices because we're going out there and we're applying things that we've learned. We're applying things that we've picked up from school, from uh, CE, from all of these things, from these different uh, manufacturers who give, give us equipment to buy. We're taking all of those components and we're now wrapping them into our root canal procedure. And we're hoping that we get an excellent result. We're hoping that we get exactly what we saw in the, in the ad or in the continuing education. That is our hope, but we don't know because there are so many different steps in there. Our process is all about developing the most predictable root canal procedure that we can, for example. So when we look at these things, we say, okay, let's take the root canal for a good example. It's not just the files that you use when you're developing your root canal procedure. That's a component. That's a line of script in the software if we're using that analogy. But we have to go back and say, just as important in the outcome of your endodontic procedure is your diagnosis. How good was it? How good was your exam? What did you do? What were your steps? What kind of imaging did you use? Did you use traditional radiography? Are you using cone beams? How did you uh, evaluate the patient when they came in? That's a piece of your process. So we look and we start there. We call that phase one. Phase one of your R&D plan is what did you do to diagnose before the patient came in? 
Phase two is the actual treatment. Now, now we get to what files do you use and what kind of obturation process do you use? All of these things that are very specific and there are so many different options here. That's phase two of our process. Phase three, post-op. What did you do afterwards to help make sure that the patient had the best outcome possible? And the great thing is we talk to doctors all of the time. I mean, all day long, we talk to doctors and I love it because we get the excitement. And if you ever wanna kind of rebuild your trust in the healthcare community, ask a doctor what they're excited about doing. Ask them to describe the procedure that they do most. And our docs go in there and they just start laying it out. Oh, I do this and I do this because I, I found this technique works and, I, and I'm reading about this other one. I wanna add it next year and, and so on and so forth. So these are the processes that when you put them together, uh, become a research and development initiative. We tie it all together. We make it look pretty. We give you some protocols to take back to your practice. But that's R&D, and it's happening every day with every patient. Your patients are your data set. It's an iterative process. You're going and saying, okay, what worked well? Great, I'll do it again. What didn't work well? Great, I'm going to take that out or replace it with something else. R&D. Oh, wow. How, how exciting. So this really is something that applies to the everyday practitioner because they are doing that R&D in their practice every single day, aren't they? They really are. And it even goes a step beyond that. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, I, I, I'm a dentist myself. I practiced, treated thousands of patients. Um, I got into healthcare law because I wanted to find ways to help protect my colleagues out there because the law can be brutal. And the real, real problem with that is we don't really have a, a very standard standard of care in healthcare. If you're gonna go to court or if you're going to go to a, a state board or anything like that, you're gonna be judged against the standard of care. But we know that there's not just one. And in fact, we have to do a critical thesis in law school. So years back, I did mine on the standard of care. And I looked at all of the different ways that we can be judged for each decision we make in healthcare. And there's a bunch, there's, there's federal, there's insurance, there's state board level. There's all of these different um, filters that go against the way that we make our decisions. By the end of it, I had 83 different categories that each one of our decisions as a healthcare provider is judged against. Now, if I wanted to be the kind of attorney that sues doctors, that is fantastic news. Because all I have to do is say, mm, you did it by process A and you had a negative outcome but there's processes B through Z here that you could have used. And because you didn't, mm -hmm. I get to now get you for that. We have an outcome-based legal system. Well, the problem with that is because we don't historically really identify our processes and go through this designation of our own research and development processes, we show up in court and we say, well, this is what I typically do. And they say, well, is that your customary practice? And you say, yes. And they're going to say, well, how? Prove it. How, how do you know that that's what you do? And that's the other benefit of the R&D uh, development process that we do with our doctors. Not only does it end up with money in their pocket, but we're helping you develop a, a treatment protocol, a clinical practice guideline, so that if you do find yourself question about what is your customary mode of care, you can now say, yes, I'm involved in a research and development product. I have a clinical practice guideline. I have something that defines what I do, and this is my customary practice. Can't tell you how many times I wish I've had that as I've represented doctors. Yeah, right. Not only are you doing that R&D, but you're, you're protecting what you do because now you've got that proven process. You know, you and I were talking a little earlier before, um, you know, there's a general dentist. He has some CAD cam in his practice, you know, lots of expenses associated with adding all those things. And, and you were able to really help him work through a process so he could get some R&D credits through that. Could you walk us through what, what happened and, and, and just give us a little case study around that? Sure. So this is a doctor who was investing in a, a CAD cam milling unit here. Um, and, you know, always R&D uh, associated with any new technology into your practice. So that's an easy one for us to pay a, a development on or a research initiative. So this guy happened to have uh, incorporated a couple of CAD CAM milling machines. He was going to training himself. He was training his staff. He was implementing the procedure of delivering these uh, milled crowns in his office. And then he was following up afterwards at recall visits to see how these crowns were taken care of. 
So these are just a few of the components, but you see some preliminary uh, component, this phase one that I talked about earlier, where you're examining the patient, you're diagnosing whether or not this is an adequate uh, uh, final prosthesis for them with this milled crown. You're delivering the, the crown through the actual procedure and then you're following up. So these are the phases. What we're able to do as we identify these um, phases is say, okay, the R&D tax credit allows us to designate what's called qualified research expenses, we call them QREs. Qualified research expenses are those expenses that apply towards the research process that you're, you're undertaking. They are for wages for your staff. That's one of the categories you can get. Supplies used up in the process of delivering your R&D process. So we can't get you anything for the purchasing the CAD CAM milling machine. That's an equipment that you're going to use over and over again. But the ceramic blocks, absolutely. Those are supplies that are used up in the process. Your sterilization, your, uh, every, your anesthesia, even like that. Yes, absolutely. That's a piece of your process there. Um, so we've got wages, we've got supplies. Uh, a third category that we can sometimes get is third-party contractors. So it, this one gets a little bit tricky, um, but sometimes it can be applied to this as well, but primarily wages and supplies. So we take this doctor that, that we're talking about here as he adds this, the CAD CAM milling to his practice and we say, okay, tell us what percentage of your staff time is used delivering this process. And he says, oh, about 25%. So the, the nice thing is the IRS doesn't allow us to estimate on too many things, but that's one of the categories that it does allow us to estimate. Um, so we don't have to say, okay, did they clock into a special category to say I'm doing R&D now? No, they don't. You just have to have the, the research leader's best estimate on what the time was there. So we take that staff time, 25% of the staff time, 25% of the doctor's W-2 wage. We take the supplies associated with this. And by the end of it, We've got, oh, what was it, Scott? Roughly three or four hundred thousand dollars that we yeah, applied to this doctor. Yeah, about four hundred uh, for for two thousand nineteen. So those are his qualified research expenses. We then have to take that and say, okay, from that, where does the actual tax credit fit in? And there's a few calculations that go in, but a real rough and dirty number is ten percent of that is your tax credit. So about a $40,000 tax credit for that doctor, which is a dollar for dollar tax credit that he gets to take now uh, for 2019 was the year we did it for him. But the real beauty of it comes in that he didn't start that in 2019. He started it in 2017. And we can go retroactive and triple his tax credit in that first year. So you can actually look backwards on this and, 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 and you don't have to, if you missed a couple of years, you can look backwards and do this then. You can. And one of the most beautiful things is when you look backwards, there's two ways of, of taking that tax credit. One of them is to roll it forward and you can carry it forward for up to 20 years. So you don't have a big uh, uh, pressure deadline on you to use it the next year. 20 years, you can carry it forward. But the other way, you can get a refund check from the IRS. It's a beautiful thing to open up that mail and get a $50,000 refund check from the IRS. Yeah, you, usually the money's going the other way, isn't it? Exactly, <laughs> yes. So, oh, wow, what a, what a powerful strategy. Now, so that's certainly the, the general dentist, but what about the specialist? Does this apply to you too, if you're a specialist? So I think specialists are even easier, to be honest with you. Um, as general dentists, we tend to be general. We, we do so many different um, practices in our day-to-day -day that sometimes we don't have a lot of staff time associated to one project or a lot of supplies associated with one project. Not the same with specialists. Um, our specialists, our orthodontists, our endodontists, our oral surgeons, boy, there's some amazing things that they're bringing into their practices, but really they do a handful of, of procedures. Our endodontists do root canals all year long, all day, every day. If you're bringing something as an endodontist, if you're bringing something new into your endodontic procedure, we get to say how much of your time is spent doing your endodontic procedure and apply that towards the wages. The great thing is, again, for some reason, we get a couple of gifts from the IRS with this tax credit. If we get up to at least 80% of doctor's time or staff time spent in one research initiative, the IRS calls that substantially all. And they give us, they gift us the extra 20%. So they allow us to take 100% 
of the wages associated with that employee uh, if, if we get to at least 80% of their time involved in one initiative. Wow, how powerful. Oh my gosh. Now, now, you know, thinking about this from, you know, a practitioner standpoint, right? Maybe you're a new dentist just getting started out, or maybe you've been in practice five or 10 years, or maybe you're near the end of your career. How does this work for each stage of dentistry that you may be in? Scott, that's a great one for you to take. Yeah, that's a good question, Tim. And it really, so, so let's talk about if you're early on in your career. You're, you're usually paying off your practice because you either bought it or you're just starting up. You are, you've got student loan debt. I mean, I was just looking up the student loan debt, according to the American Dental Association, the average debt in 2019 was $292,000 coming out of dental school. So that, that's a pretty big animal to go to eat on. And I know a lot of your dentists are in California, right, Tim? That's correct. And so if you're in California, you're faced with a high tax bracket you're not getting a benefit for making that payment on your student loan. So if, you, if you're trying to pay off $300,000 of student loans, you've got to make about $500,000. You've got to pay roughly between the state and your federal. Even if your federal is low at 32 or 24, by the time you add in the state, you're close to 40 cents on the dollar. So you've got to make a half a million to earn enough to pay off that $300,000. Now that's kind of hard to do um, just in general. And so it can take you a long time to get out of debt from a student perspective. But I did a little quick math for you. If you were to take and you got just a $30,000 tax credit every year, you come out, you have, a, you have you only a couple staff, you're just getting started, you get a $30,000 tax credit, and you applied all of that to getting rid of your student debt, you'd be done in seven years, Tim. If you said, hey, I'm going to need some of that money to live on, I'm going to need to keep some of this extra tax money to buy more equipment, other things I want to add to my practice, if that's the case, if you took just half that credit, Tim, you're still debt free in 11 years. My guess is if we looked at most dental people at their 11 year mark, they're probably still trying to figure out how to get rid of some of that last bit of their student debt, and they've had to pay a ton of that extra money. So this is a great assist in getting you debt free and building up your cash for whatever other reasons in the beginning you need. And we all know the first rule of business is stay in business. And the second rule of business is don't forget rule number one. So if that's what you're trying to do, it's a great way to kind of pair those two together and help those guys save some extra money. Um, if you're in the twilight of your career, it's a little different look. You're usually looking for in the twilight of your career, you're looking for ways to save money extra in your 401k. You're trying to set aside money because let's all be honest, retirement's all about lifestyle and lifestyle's all about your cash flow. So the more you're gonna get, and how am I gonna sell my practice off? And when you go sell your practice off, how much are you giving of that to the IRS? That can be a huge part of how much money you end up with. R&D tax credits can help you. Imagine what Ben was talking about that you took and you are brand new to us and you've been in business for decades and we identify a tax credit you for $50,000 and you're in the twilight of your career and we say, hey, you can go back three years. So now we can look at 19, 7, 18 and 17 and you can address 20, four years. That's almost a quarter million dollars. I mean, if you're a dentist listening to this right now and somebody handed you a quarter million dollars, is that going to make a difference? Absolutely. Huge difference for the next few years and what you're able to save, retire with. That just gives you a lot of fodder. If you're brand new and you're trying to figure out how to make it through a COVID year when the American Dental Association shut you down earlier this year and you're trying to get that revenue up this year, this is a great way to say, hey, wait a minute, guys. Help me do two or three years and let me literally take that 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars for the last few years and roll all that forward and really eliminate my tax burden for 2020. That can make a huge difference in your ability to remember rule number one, stay in business. Yep. Um, and so if you're at the end of your career, we can show you a couple of different things that are really unique to what we do. Um, you could help that do some Roth conversions. Everybody's always, all dentists wish they could get a Roth IRA. Most of them make too much to be able to get one. 
Um, this is a great way to bridge that gap and figure out a way to get one uh, or a Roth conversion done for yourself. You can um, also look at taking some of that extra money and creating a second pension plan for yourself. I mean, imagine you have one social security, if that's good, how much better is a second social security that you can get? Um, and that's a very practical application with some of those credits that you can look at in the twilight of your career. So there's a lot of easy things that someone can do. And I, I missed the guy in the middle, but if you're in the middle and you're just in the middle of your career and you've got your head down and you're working hard, the number one thing for you is taxes are taking all of your money. And if taxes are taking all your money, you've got to find a way to mitigate that. Because if you don't, he gets all your money and you end up with very little. And if you're in California, you know that you're in the second highest tax um, state in the U.S. The only, New York's the only one that's, that beats you out, not by much. So, and we're, that's- We're trying to change that out here. We want to be number one. Oh wait, yeah, that's yeah. a bad thing, Never mind. But we are trying to change that. Yeah, that, that's maybe not one of those where you want to be number one, but I get the idea behind that. Um, so, so in just from a practical standpoint, a lot of doctors or dentists look at this and say, I get there's a credit there. How do I use it? Let us brainstorm ideas with you and you tell us what is hurting you in your business, what you, where you want to grow, who you're trying to, how you're trying to grow. Like, let's say you're trying to get a second location going. You've maybe been in business 10 years, five years, and you're going, Hey, if you take what Ben just told you and you use those practice guidelines, now you have a franchisable way to go set up that second location. You take that very practical application, you take this extra money, and now you have a very practical temporal or, or monetary way to be able to set up that second location. And then that second location, it's going to create supplies, wages, it's going to add in more staff. And all of those are going to increase your research and development credits, which then help you in that very first year getting off the ground, um, keeping that extra money. So you can literally take and earn more in that second practice and give yourself a means to keep that in the bank account, which for a lot of people, that's a big deal. Yeah, very, very important these days. So, so what goes into the documenting all this research and, and, and development? Because because I'm listening to this thinking, man, that could be a lot of work to have to do. So what does that process look like? And how do you help, how do you really assist someone through that, that documenting and creating these processes and procedures? Well, I think it, there's two sides to documenting. And I think Ben should cover the part. So there's documenting the medical part and then, and then documenting the day-to-day -day, um, wages, salaries, and things like that. And why don't you kind of cover some of the, just the real documenting the procedure and kind of how we do that. And then I'll talk to them about how we do some of the other. Sure. So we start off with an interview for our doctors and really our goal, Tim, is look, there's almost nobody busier than your docs there. And we know that when we get on the phone with them, not only are they busy, but they've got a, a few hats they're wearing at any given time. We want this to be as easy as possible for them. So we really take steps to make this, a fluid and seamless process for them. So we're going to do an interview. I'm, I'm on that interview and we're gonna find out, we're gonna identify, so what are some things you're doing in your practice that we could vet, that we could say qualify for this? We're gonna get an idea of what your procedure looks like. We're going to put together and I'm going to build um, with my team, these clinical practice guidelines and supporting documents. And just so you know, Tim, these are usually for a, a single initiative, maybe 30 pages for a multi-initiative, we're talking a 60 to 90 page document here. So these are not small, easy things to put together. Um, and why? Well, because by golly, we're gonna make this defensible. We're not gonna do this halfway. We're gonna go in there and say, okay, if we had to stand up and defend this and protect what you've gotten here, or if you had to be in court and defend what you do, we want this this document to stand the test of, of that type of incursion there. So we take the extra steps. We build these really well. As far as what the doctor has to do, not much though. Most of it's on us. We're going to have an interview. There is some contemporaneous reporting requirements, but guess what? You're already doing those. You're doing those because you talk about your process with your morning huddle, with your, your monthly staff meetings. And 
every time you finish a patient procedure, you and your assistant are probably having a meeting or reviewing patient notes or something to that effect that is the contemporaneous note keeping. And we do a wonderful job with this in healthcare. We get it easy because we have patient records. It is the most contemporaneous record of this kind of procedure and, and development that we could possibly have. It's all protected by HIPAA. It's all there though. It's what we do as our customary practice or what you do as a healthcare professional. So that's in a nutshell, it's an interview with us. It's discussing what you already do in your office. You're not, not gonna make a whole lot of changes. Maybe you'll review what we have as your clinical practice guideline and give us a couple of directions you want it to go in, but that's it. We're gonna handle the rest of it for you. Wow, right, you, you want it to be easy because oftentimes, right, the more you can remove the friction, you can get more things done, right? You, you want a team of people who can help you do these things. Oh yeah, I've been there. I know how busy it is in that practice, jumping from operatory to operatory. The last thing you want to do at the end of the day is have to sit through and wade through this. So we're going to handle it. We're going to help you get that credit and make it as easy as we can. Excellent. And then Tim, while he's doing that clinical guideline study and putting all that together, we assign that, um, that doctor, we assign them a practice consultant who walks them through all the rest of the process. That's visiting with their CPA and making sure that the tax, um, everything from a tax standpoint is put together, that their numbers, we're getting their wages, we're getting all of that information documented so that we have a defensible position. And, and a lot of our doctors love the fact that we actually take a third party and we have a third party review the whole procedure to make sure from a tax standpoint that we can warranty the work that's being done. So imagine you're this, you're this doctor and you're doing this study and it sounds really great, right? And everybody always says, well, okay, where's my catch? The catch is it has to be reviewed and, and documented that in an audit, we can warranty that. And then we can come back and say, and Dr. Tax Credit puts it in writing for him, Tim, that, hey, in the event that you're challenged on one of these initiatives that you're undertaking, that we actually warrant that with the first dollar coming back out of Dr. Tax Credit, we'll put our first dollar back towards the success of that audit. And so there, it's a, that's a warranty that we haven't seen duplicated out there, Tim. It's one that should help you sleep well at night if you're a dentist or a doctor and you're saying, hey, do I undertake this? Hey, I stock to about a couple hundred CPAs a year and about 90% of them use the research and development credit in their practice. I just talked to a CPA yesterday, Tim, and you know what he said? He goes, well, we kind of come up just with a number. And I said, well, what number did you come up with? And he told me it was an orthodontist. They, they fit right along those guidelines that Ben was talking about earlier, where they should have had about a $40,000 research and development credit. You want to know how much they're taking? With no background, no research study, no anything, they're taking a few thousand dollars a year. And so they're putting in a, an R&D and a general business R&D credit and getting a few thousand dollars a year. And this guy is literally um, losing out on tens of thousands of dollars that could be done much better than his CPA and not knocking a CPA. It's just the CPA and him. This is the best they could come up with as they're talking every year. And the CPA says, let's do some tax planning. He goes, hey, you, you probably qualify for this credit. And they take a general um, credit towards that rather than doing something very specific like this, really underselling the ability and what is on the table for them. So when you can do that study and do it with a high level of warranty behind it and a high level of scrutiny before it ever gets to the final and then have their CPA sign off on it in that process, that practice consultant literally just grabs them and walks them through that while this clinical guideline study is being done. And so we kind of think it's a one-two punch. You, you're getting all of the right documentation and all the right tax planning, and those are coming together in a way that very few people ever have done for them. Yeah. Wow. Ben, Scott, thank you. This is so powerful. And I, I know I certainly know more about how that R&D credit applies to dentists and definitely a, a new way of thinking about, you know, dental practices and, and more importantly, right, definitely excited about finding some, some money in the practice that's already there for the work you're already doing. And so any closing thoughts for us? 
I would just echo what, what you said there, Tim, is, you know, doctors, you're already doing this. This is not adding any bit of effort, any change required to get this R&D tax credit. It's just recognizing it. It's having someone who can write the report for you and taking advantage of these uh, codes that were put in place to reward you for the, uh, for the excellent work you're providing to your patients there. Excellent. And how can people find you? How can we get in touch with you? If you go to drtaxcredit.com and just throw in your name, a phone, and an email, we can set up an appointment to talk with you. And, and, and Tim, I, I want to kind of call a lot of the, if you're on this video and you're listening to us and you're saying, okay, my call to action to you is to pick your brain for just one second at the end of this call. Do you have a piece of equipment you want to add to your practice? You just aren't sure how you're going to cash for it. You need to visit with us. If you're trying to hire another hygienist or somebody else into your practice, a PA if you're a doctor, someone like that, and you're saying, I need to add that component, I just can't fit it in my budget, you need us. Our R&D tax credit is going to give you that leverage to make that happen. Your customer service is going to improve. The level of quality that you put out, which obviously what you put out comes back to you. So that means your practice growth. So Dr. Ta www.drtaxcredit.com. Come and see us. Help. We will help you get that. Let us look at your finances with you and set those goals and use this credit to help you get those things accomplished. We do very practical planning with a ton of our dentists. Uh, some of the first things we ask is, what are you trying to get done? Let's talk about what your goals are. That, that's really our call to action is jump on our website and let's find you those monies. You know you need it. You know you want to grow the level of customer service. You're dying to make it better. I haven't met a dentist yet that doesn't say, man, I want to be the number one in my area. I got plenty of competitors. How do I separate myself? And a lot of times it comes down to having enough cash to make that difference. And we can make that available to you. So go to drtaxcredit.com, throw in your information, and let's get talking about how to grow your practice. I know you want that extra piece of equipment. You know it, and I know it. Let's help you find a way to be able to get the money to get it. Well, excellent. So fantastic closing thoughts. So thanks for tuning in to another edition of Dentalpreneur Secrets and uh, get out there and go make it a great day.